Hi there, this is topic 9, class 1 for MG5004 and DE5418 and we're going to be looking at differentiation. We'll start with a little bit of the intuition for differentiation. A lot of what engineers analyse involves change. Looking at things, quantities of things that are varying. We look at the temperature of a coolant, the voltage on a transmission line, the torque on a turbine blade. All of these are things changing and the best technique to look at this is calculus both branches whether we're looking at differential calculus or integral calculus this idea of calculus is not new integration was actually developed by archimedes though the work on differential calculus came much later with fermat and barrow and newton and leibniz um, so you know it's it's not new newton and leibniz though they worked into independently they fully realised the connection of the earlier work, which is where um, they were finding the area of a shape, and the later work, finding the tangent to a curve, and in particular the slope of the tangent at the maximum or minimum, and the fact that the processes are the reverse of each other, which is what we'll find too when we come to do integration, that it's the reverse of differentiation. Now, you know that if we've got a, a straight line, a constant slope, you know that the slope of that is the rise over the run. And, you know, you, you know about the distance being given as, as s equals ut, and you've got a, a, a curve as, as we've got here. The velocity then, u, so if you've got s equals ut, then the velocity is the rate of change of distance with respect to time. Now, on a distance time graph, it's the gradient of the straight line representing the relationship between the distance travelled and the time elapsed. Now, this is a special case where the velocity is constant and the distance travelled is a linear function of time. Even when velocity does vary with time, it's still given by the gradient of the distance time graph. So, even though it varies, it's still given by the gradient of the distance time graph. In the straight line, we can find the slope by using the tangent, but we need another technique for finding the slope at a point on a non-straight line. Let's have a look at diagram A. Suppose we want to find the velocity at the time t equals t1, so at point P. The velocity is given by the gradient of the graph at that time, at the time that t equals t1. So what we can do is in picture B, diagram B, we can enlarge the graph and then we can enlarge it again in graph C. As we enlarge the graph you can see that it's getting closer and closer to a straight line. If we zoom in ever closer we can look at look more at what happens on either side but very close to t1. So at point p we're pretty close to a straight line. That means that if we could zoom in infinitely, in other words in the limit, the gradient of the curve would be given by the gradient, again in the limit, of the straight line a, b. So then we could write that the gradient was approximately equal to the value of the function at t1 plus h minus the value of the function at t1, in other words the rise over the run, which is t minus t minus h, which is just h. So that's a plus there, and that's a t. So what we've got is it's the official story. This is the, the background story. You don't need to know this for the exam, but it's a good idea to know this as the background. So in the limit, again, it's a kind of hypothetical thing, but in the limit, the gradient will be the limit of this function, of this fraction, sorry. And if we think of h as being delta t, then we can write that slope in the limit as being the limit as d 
delta t tends towards zero. So we're getting closer and closer that a and b are getting closer and closer to each other. That the in the limit we're talking about the rise. over the run. Typically, we define this gradient as the derivative. And you're probably more likely to see it as the limit as delta x tends towards 0 of f of x plus delta x minus f of x all over delta x. And we would write that as f dash of x, or we might write it as y dash, or we might write it as dy by dx. D is the anglicized version of the delta symbol. Delta means change. It's all about the change in y with respect to the change in x. This is the standard differentiation diagram. And what it says here is that the slope of the curve is the slope of the tangent to the curve at that point. In this case, it's the slope of the tangent to the curve at the point P. Here's a more complicated diagram, but you can see how if delta x tends towards zero, the chord, which would be the best guess for your slope, actually becomes a tangent. So if we bring these two lines closer and closer together, so that delta x tends towards zero, then the chord becomes a tangent, and we can find the slope of the curve at that point P. The official story then, we can talk about the derivative as being the rate of change of the function with respect to x, or if we are drawing it, and, and a lot of people get hung up with this, they say that the derivative is the gradient. The derivative is only the gradient when we have the situation drawn on a graph. In the real world, when we're talking about something, something in particular, we're not talking about the gradient, we are talking about the rate of change. So if we're drawing it on a graph, yes, we talk about the tangent, but if in life we're talking about it, it's the rate of change. Now, we do need to be a little careful about the function we want to differentiate. In the previous example, the slopes of the curve on either side of the point and the limit were equal. But if we look at the function that we've got on this slide, the slopes on either side of the point, that's the point x equals 3 pi over 2, so that point there, they're different. So we say that this function is not differentiable. So the curve is not well behaved, if you like, at 3 pi over 2. So we can't differentiate it at 3 pi over 2. Similarly, if you look at these two graphs, they're not differentiable everywhere either. They are differentiable everywhere except, say, for the first one, except at x1. And for the second one, they're differentiable everywhere except at 0. But we just have to be a little bit careful when we're talking about this. So if we excluded that point, it would be differentiable. And if we excluded that point, it would be differentiable. But it's not differentiable everywhere because we have these couple of points where it's not differentiable. Now we can do these from first principles. You're not going to be examined on doing it from first principles, but it is kind of a good idea to see at least one of these examples done by first principles. Let's have a look at the second one here. So we've got <clears throat> that the derivative by definition is the limit as delta x tends towards 0 of x plus delta x put into the function, and the function is cube your input, minus x cubed divided by delta x. Okay, so we need to expand the brackets and it would be x cubed plus 3x squared delta x plus 3x delta x squared 
plus delta x cubed minus x cubed all divided by delta x just using some plain algebra here now what we've got is the x cubed minus the x cubed that disappears and as delta x tends to zero so that term goes that term goes this one that cancels out was that that cancels out with one of those and leaving two of those so what we've got left then is 3x squared plus 3x delta x plus delta x squared now and as delta x tends to zero this term and this term tend to zero as as well and all we've got left is 3x squared now you probably knew that that was the the case but that's why it is the case so we can do it from first principles but we're not going to in general however you should if you did do those for those um, from first principles or if you know it you would see that there is a pattern so that you know the pattern that the if finding the derivative of x to the power of n the derivative is n x n to the power of uh, sorry n x to the power of n minus one so, so that's the standard <laughs> the standard thing we talk about that as being the power rule and it's the really the best one to remember you don't even need to look it up you just remember that one in this one in your own time find the derivative from first principles we'll use it um, by the rules that I'm sure you know that the derivative would be 25 minus 10 X and we need to put in X equals 1 so then the derivative is going to be 25 minus 10 which would be equal to 15 question then asks find the equation of the tangent to the point at 120 okay so what we've got so far is that the slope of the tangent at the point x equals 1 which is where y is 20 the slope is equal to 15 so what we've got is that m equals 15 now you remember from earlier work that y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 and we know that y1 is 20 we now know that m is 15 and we know that x1 is 1 and if we rearrange that we can get that y is equal to 15x plus 5 to do part d the slope of the normal normal just means that right angles to is is going to be found from n m equals negative 1 so if m is 15 then n is going to be negative 1 over 15 and we do the same thing y minus 20 is equal to the slope of the normal times x minus 1 which would give us uh, y is equal to a fifteenth of of 301 minus x so just a little bit of algebra there jiggling around to find that as usual there are some rules the derivative of k where k is a constant times a function you can bring the k out and it's k times the derivative if you have the derivative of a sum the answer is the sum of the derivatives as I said before we don't do differentiation from first principles that's where the stuff is coming from you will look up a table of derivatives the in the fourth edition of the text the one that I've got page 722 there is a list <clears throat> you can look it up you can have it on your screen you can have it wherever or you could just learn them for do any harm but you just look up a list 
if we can find the first derivative, then we can find the second derivative, because the second derivative, we just do it again. If we've done it twice, we can do it a third time, and so on. So the, the second derivative of displacement must be acceleration, because it's the derivative of the derivative. The derivative was velocity, so the rate of change of velocity is acceleration. So the second derivative of the displacement function is acceleration. Let's have a look at a couple of questions here. Let's have a look at the first one. We've got y equals 3x to the power of 4 minus 2x squared plus x minus 1. The first derivative is going to be 4 3 is a 12x cubed minus 4x plus 1. And the second derivative is going to be 36x squared minus 4. Question B, the function is y equals natural log of x over x, which we could write as natural log of x times x to the negative 1. Now at this stage, we don't officially know how to differentiate a product. This is a product, but we will shortly. So we'll come back to this one. Right now, in fact, we will come back to this. We need to be able to differentiate a product. And it's not the derivatives of the product multiplied together. It has its own special rule that you need to learn. So it's u v dash plus v u dash. What I like to do is I like to write out my function. So that's my first function. I need to write out my second function. I need to write out my derivative of the first function. I need to write out the derivative of my second function. Now, writing it out this way means then it's easy for me to remember the product rule in the reverse order from my original writing. I remember it as u dash v plus u v dash. And I can say that because both multiplication and addition are commutative. And the reason I do that is it leads into one of the integration rules, integration by parts, but also it leads into the easy way to remember the quotient rule, which is how you differentiate something over something. So again, you would set out u equals, that's the top line, v equals the bottom line, u dash is the derivative of that, v dash is that, so I would remember the derivative of a quotient as being u dash v, this time minus u v dash, divided by v squared. Looking at a, I would write that u was equal to 2x squared plus 5, and v was equal to x squared plus 3x plus 1 u dash was then equal to 4x, and v dash is equal to 2x plus 3. So now our derivative is equal to 4x times x squared plus 3x plus 1, plus u, which would be 2x squared plus 5, times v dash. And depending on the situation, you could use it, leave it there, or multiply it out. It depends what you were wanting to use it for. Let's have a look at C. Y is equal to root x over x plus 1. It's something over, so we're going to use the quotient rule. So we would say that u equals root x, x to the half would be fine. And v is equal to x plus 1 u dash would be a half x to the negative a half and v dash would be 1 so the derivative would be a half x to the negative a half times x plus 1 minus x to the half 
times 1 over, now it's v squared, not v dash, so it's over x plus 1 squared. And again, it's a matter of algebra to tidy that up, or depending on what you need it for, you could just leave it like that. We will do this example in class. It's a bit long-winded to do on a sheet here. Sometimes we have composite functions, and in that case, we need to use the chain rule. I'd like to have a look at the second one here. So we've got y equals natural log x squared plus x plus 1. When we've got a chain, uh, sorry, when we've got a natural log function, there is a special rule that says to differentiate a natural log function, the derivative equals the derivative of the bracket over the bracket. So let's do it that way, so dy by dx equals the derivative of the bracket, which is 2x plus 1 over x squared plus x plus 1. Now if you're going to use the chain rule for that, you would say let u equal x squared plus x plus 1 and then y equals the natural log of u. So dy by du equals 1 over u, and du by dx equals 2x plus 1. And then the chain rule says that dy by dx equals dy by du times du by dx, so now it's just a matter of putting those bits together, dy by du is 1 over u times 2x plus 1, and we can't leave it as 1 over u, so we need to replace that as 1 over x squared plus x plus 1 times 2x plus 1. For, <clears throat> excuse me, for an exponential function, we could either do it explicitly or we could take the rule that it's the derivative of the power times the original. If we've got an e function. So the derivative would be the derivative of the power times the original. And maybe, or maybe not, you'd do some algebra to tidy that up. Now, just watch out for questions like this, where it says, given z of y equals y cubed, and y of x equals 2x squared minus x, find dz by dx, just think about what that's saying in order that you find dz by dx. Now these next ones are tricky. I think we will do them in class. They require a little bit more space than we've got here. But have a go. See if you can find, see if you can prove that the derivative of um, the inverse tan is equal to one over uh, one over one plus x squared. See if you can prove that, and let's see if you can prove the second one is equal to. Oops, it's actually, So the second one would be equal to x to the x times 1 plus natural log of x. And for the third one, see if you can do that. If you can't, we will do it in class.
The chain rule is used with the inverse function rule to, to find derivatives when a function is specified parametrically. Um, it's quite, quite, quite straightforward that dy by dx equals 1 over dx by dy. Doesn't make any any um, any sense not to say that. Sometimes in maths there are quick ways and there are not so quick ways. If we look at the quick way first, we've got x equals t cubed and y equals t squared. Then y must equal x to the two thirds by logic. So we can find that dy by dx is equal to two thirds x to the negative a third. Not a problem. Let's do it the, the longer way. So we need to use um, this formula here. We'll do that. So we've got that dy by dt is equal to 2t. And dx by dt is equal to 3t squared. So reciprocal finding the reciprocal of that it's going to be 1 over 3t squared so dy by dx is going to be according to our rule 2t times 1 over 3t squared which is equal to 2 over 3t now obviously t can't equal 0 and let's see, we don't need it in terms of t, we want it in terms of x, but we've got that x is equal to t cubed, so t must equal the cubed root of t. So if we put that into there, we've got the answer that we had before. Like that. Now if we look at the graph, the function doesn't actually have a well-behaved tangent at x equals 0. And we already kind of probably figured that out from there. So the function as a whole is not differentiable. But if we exclude 0, then it would be fine.